New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. Can Can I I clarify a point? Uh, Yes. Okay. Because you need to... I never... You just created Love Canal on your last... Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I never threw out nerve gas, nerve agent, into the ground. Yeah. I... I worked for a company that did that. I actually cleaned it up. So uh, I like never... Paper towel and some I, borax. Th- th- <laughs> You're just proving Mr. Termot's point that individuals should be cleaning up stuff instead of government. I thought he was going... That voice belongs to Matt Hartman, by the way. Oh, yeah. I thought he was going to tear into him and ask him, sir, do you drink hydrogen water or not? <laughs> Speaking of which, so Honest Donna has sent me some questions for you. EcoGo Plus. Do you use EcoGo Plus as your minimal is, water? Is your, your the hydrogen um, water? Yes. Uh, do you use mineral water in your bottle? I use RO water. RO water. Do you notice it has a taste? No. It and have uh, a taste. lastly, have you seen any benefits from it? Lower cholesterol, less joint pain. Anything like that? Any physical health advantages to drinking? I water? I don't know about the cholesterol. Um, is I it's far. <laughs> I do so much. It's hard to single out if if it's the uh, with supplements and exercise. Mm-hmm. It's hard to separate separate out whether it's one thing or not that's having improvements. Are you at all concerned it made your beard fall out? <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake on my part with no. a razor. You know, just keep keep the clean look, man. You look good. Hey. Our guest in this next segment is Glenn Allen, who, along with Richard Kaufman, has co-authored a book called Played, The Games of the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And uh, he joins us via telephone right now as uh, we are currently enjoying the 2024 Olympics. Glenn, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Great to have you. Tomorrow, by the way, was the day in 1936 when Jesse Owens won his fourth gold medal at the 1936 uh, Olympics. And Jesse Owens was a big part of those uh, 1936 Olympics, as was Louis Zamperini, uh, who uh, maybe you remember that uh, uh, his uh, movie and his story of his life when he was shot down in World War II and then taken prisoner in a Japanese prisoner of war camp and then uh, ultimately released toward the end of World War II and survived the ordeal, lived to be into his 90s. Uh, Glenn, let's talk about those 1936 Summer Olympics, which we remember as the Olympics of Adolf Hitler, too, don't we? That's right. And you mentioned Jesse Owens winning his fourth gold. And um, there's a great story about how that happened. So there were two Jewish runners on the 4 by 100 relay team. One of them was Marty Glickman who you might know became a famous uh, sports broadcaster. Yes. And the morning of the race, the two Jewish runners were kicked off the team as to not insult Hitler. And Jesse was added to, to the team, and that's how he won his fourth gold. Oh, I, I actually didn't know that story. That's a great story. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of stories say that um, everybody protested all the athletes protested, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't kick these guys off the team, etc. Jesse did not. And his rationale was, look how I'm treated back in America. I don't want to hear about mm-hmm. prejudice. Sure. So it was an opportunity to win a fourth goal, which no one had done to that point. But I think he makes a compelling argument. Played, blends, politics, sports, espionage, and courage, all in a world world setting where the most popular hero is American sprinter and long jumper Jesse Owens, as we just talked about there. Uh, it feels real because it is based on real events, real outcomes, and real people, including American Olympic Committee President Avery Brundage, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Charlie Chaplin, Joseph Goebbels, and Ava Braun. Tell me how all these folks are intertwined into this book. Well, that's where we got the title from, Played. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, in the Olympics, um, politics, they always infuse their muddy fingers, right? Because it's the world stage. The whole world is watching. It's kind of unavoidable now. But here's where they cross the line. They use the athletes as pawns in order to get the Americans to not boycott the Olympics. So what they did was there was a, the best women high jumper in the world. Her name was Gretel Bergman. She was Jewish, banished from Germany well before the Olympics. But 
as a, uh, a debate over whether or not the U.S. should boycott the games, as that grew through threats of violence to her and her family, the Germans brought her back from London to compete for the Germans and to show America that they were treating their Jewish athletes fairly. Now, the minute the U.S. team got on the boat to cross the Atlantic, she was kicked off the team. And they, the Germans, they needed America to come because the whole world is watching and waiting to see if we would boycott or not. Tell me how this uh, story unfolds. Are, are, is any of it uh, obviously, obviously based on, on history? Is there anything in here in regards to how the story is told that is not true or based on history? It is all based on history. The only thing that we invented was some of the dialogue, of course. And it, I want to stress it is a novel, not a history book. Mm -hmm. But everything in it is true. And, you know, of course, we had to make up some dialogue. But it was all based on about 25 years of research into these characters and what they were like, what their personalities were like. So I don't think anything in there is a stretch. All right. What is your hook in the book? In other words, what, what keeps it going from, from one chapter to the next? Well, the first half of the book is about the vote. So it's, you see all the athletes training, competing, and that's all they want to do is compete. You know, the American athletes as well as the German athletes and other athletes around the world. But this boycott is really, really stirring up a lot of emotion. And um, that of the American Olympic Committee, Avery Brundage, who you might know, he was desperate to become a member of the International Olympic Committee, where he had lots of German friends. And he was also a notorious anti-Semite. And he actually uses his, his mob influence to coerce some of the voters to go against the AAU and win the vote. So there's a lot of, a lot of drama, a lot of intrigue there um, as across the Atlantic, Hitler is gaining power at the same time. And then, of course, the second half of the book is the actual event, which is all the drama of the athletes. And um, we really try to show in an entertaining way how the athletes rise above it all. And it becomes a very heroic story. I, I, someone told me at the end of the book, you want to stand up and cheer for these athletes. Because did... they show real sportsmanship and real humanity in the face of all this turmoil. Glenn, how does espionage figure into the book? Well, the ambassador to Germany, William Dodd, who you might know from the great book In the Garden of Beasts, um, his wife was friends with a woman named, named Mildred Fischhornack, who was a communist spy and who was plotting to assassinate Hitler. And that's another part of the, of the drama that builds throughout the first half of the book. And uh, you see what happens to her. Obviously, she was not successful. What, this is John Gilstrap. Wasn't Dodd's daughter dating the head of the Gestapo <laughs> at the time? At yes. The... Yeah, well, her and, and some other people, too. Some right. high-ranking uh, Nazis. She was a... Uh, yeah, she was a real a real problem. So that was a complicated nineteen thirty six. It was two years before Kristallnacht. So at, at at that point, what was um, with the American people? Uh, you know, Jesse Owens, obviously black, was he received as a hero in the United States uh, oh, contemporaneously, and and was some of the edge taken off because of his race, or was he just embraced as a hero across the, you know, just as as a hero? Well, you know, he, he fought for equal rights the rest of his life. Um, I have to think that had a big part, had a big part, not not only crushing Hitler's myth of Aryan supremacy, but four gold medals at, at the time that, that was unheard of. Um, so I, I like he was received well. Some of the other athletes. Uh, not so much. At that point, was Hitler's uh, commitment to Aryan supremacy well known? I get lost in that period of history because he he came to power what nineteen thirty two or thirty three something like that. So by thirty six was right. was the Aryan thing <laughs> the Aryan thing was the the I don't was that drumbeat well known yeah. at that point? 
I wouldn't say it was well known. It was well known in, within Germany, but you know his, his anti-Jewish doctrines uh, were certainly well known and not universally opposed. You know, in, in 1934 there was a a massive pro-Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden. So, you know, one of the questions we we asked the reader at the beginning of the book would the call, would the Holocaust have happened? had the U.S. boycotted the games. And it, it's something that was posed to us when the very first person read the book. And, it, you know, we can't answer that, of course. But it's worth exploring. What do you and think? Know, the Holocaust didn't happen overnight. I, th- I think that's the point. It didn't happen overnight. It was a long, long process of many, many years that, that built and built and built. And Hitler, you know, of course, was received as a savior of sorts after Germany was in a very deep depression after World War One, And so, you know, it, it, it does reflect some of today's politics as well, which, I, which is we don't preach in the book, but we let the reader make their own assumptions. You know, Hitler's mantra, one of his slogans was make Germany great again. Another was uh, another one was the lying press. All these things he railed about, and created a sort of tribalism that um, that you saw almost a hundred years ago, and here we are. Matt Harvey or John Gilstrap, did you have a follow? Yeah, go ahead, John. If you got I just want to: <clears throat> was it discussed at at high levels in Washington to boycott the Olympics? Because as I recall, the Roosevelt administration. Um, had a pretty anti-Semitic at that point, pretty anti-Semitic thread through it, uh, just from in yeah, the Garden of know, Beasts. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, Roosevelt um, was approached by by Jewish leaders and the head of the AAU, uh, a great character named Judge Mahoney, who's one of the heroes in the book. Um, he was approached, but he his attitude was to keep politics out of sports. Ironically. Um, Maybe anti-Semitic sentiment was a part of that. Um, and Dodd, you know, Dodd was not one of the, um, you know, Ivy League. Um, you know, he, was, he wasn't one of the boys in Washington. So his warnings went largely unheeded. They kind of wrote him off as a scandal monger, you know, country boy, even though he was from Chicago. But um so, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, concern about a, about a boycott. They left it to the AAU and the head of the uh, the Olympic Committee, Avery Brundage, who's one of the real villains in the story. Yeah, you mentioned Avery Brundage there, and Mike Pavlik, who's a retired school teacher, who said uh, Avery Brundage went on to serve as IOC president in '72 when the games returned to Germany and Munich. He declared the games will go on when the Israeli weightlifting team was murdered. As we all remember, uh, who are of a certain age, that attack in 1972. Uh, any- yeah, Brundage, he 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 accomplished his goal. He got the Americans to Berlin. They put him on the uh, the International Olympic Committee and kicked off um, someone who was opposed to us competing and, and the anti-Jewish doctrines. A guy named Ernst Janke, and um, he eventually became the president of the Olympic Committee. Indeed. You mentioned about politics and the Olympics. It's practically impossible to keep politics out of the Olympics when teams compete under the banner of their nation, and if you win the gold, they play your anthem as well. So I, I think the two are kind of terminally intertwined, don't you think? Absolutely. And the good thing, though, is what, what you see and what I've seen in these games in Paris, which which I've loved. You see this some great... Um, examples of sportsmanship, which again, it's it's you know the Olympic ideals are supposed to be about the competition, all about the athletes, you know the thrill of victory, strength, athleticism of this contest, and it never it, it's always about more. But it seems the athletes are the ones who seem to to, to rise above it, just as they did in '36 most of the time. Matt Harvey. Mr. Allen, the uh, I I think I hear you saying that that 
Olympics certainly have an influence on our culture, on our world. And I'd like to hear just a little bit more about how the 1936 Olympics could have had an influence over the Holocaust. It, well, had the, had the U.S. boycotted and all the other countries followed suit, it may have raised awareness as to what was going on. Now, as you mentioned, that there was an anti-Semitic sentiment all over the world, but who knows what would have happened? You know, um, Germany, you know, the Nazis did raise a fair amount of money. It kind of um, brought them back into the world stage with this giant spectacle. You know, it wasn't just another Olympics. Um, you know, Goebbels really saw this as an opportunity to show how great Germany was. And it, if that goes away, oh. it may have been, uh, you know, it may have been a different reaction. I understand. To, uh, so the rise of the Nazis. So if, if America would have boycotted, maybe other countries would have followed suit and it would have been an international embarrassment for Germany? Yes, exactly. What impacts do you see the current Olympics having, if any? Well, there's a big difference now. You know, the athletes all have a voice because of technology. That's one obvious difference. It's like every athlete seems to have their own brand and their own Instagram page, and, and they can speak out now. So, you know, you've seen that a little bit with, with um, uh, the, bo the boxing, and, you know, with the, uh, I don't know if you call him transgender mm -hmm. or not, but, and he, he spoke, he's speaking out about human rights. Um, and whether that's fair or not, that's another discussion. But, you know, these athletes now can voice their opinions, and, which was very different from 1936. You know, nobody knew about Gretel Bergman. For example, no one knew about Marty Glickman and what happened to him. You know that that wouldn't happen today. Our guest or if it did, the world would hear about it. Our guest is Glenn Allen, who, along with Richard Kaufman, co-written a book called "Played: The Games of the 1936 Berlin uh, Olympics." Why tackle this subject, uh, uh, Glenn? Well, it was brought to me. Uh, I was um, me and Richard are filmmakers. I've mm -hmm. uh, been filmmakers for 30 years. Um, we wrote this as a, well, when he brought me the project, I thought, well, this would make a great movie. And as we got into it, we got into the characters and we saw all the racism, sexism, all these things that happen today. You know, there was even a transgender athlete on the German women's high jump team named Dora Ratched. Uh, this is well before Caitlyn Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner. Mm -hmm. Um so we saw all these things that were relatable to today, and we're also big, big sports fans, big history buffs, love politics, and it just it became an outline for a TV series, and that outline became the novel, which we're trying to make into a TV series. I think would be great. Tell me how Charlie Chaplin, and a lot of people don't know about this guy's complex history. Tell me how Charlie Chaplin falls into this story. Well, Chaplin was actually friends with one of our, our two main characters, Alan Gould from the Associated Press. He's kind of like the eyes and ears. He's the conscious uh, of the story, basically. And he was friends with another man named John Kieran, who wrote for the New York Times. And they both traveled to Berlin to cover the games. And Kieran was friends with Chaplin. So they meet up with Chaplin, have a conversation about, about Hitler. And after that, Hitler... Uh, Chaplin went on to direct The Great Dictator. So when you start to write a screenplay like this, how much research do you do into the history of the 1936 Summer Olympics, and, and who do you go to for expertise? Well, as I mentioned, it was, it was brought to me back in the 90s by my writing partner, uh, Richard Kaufman. And since then, we, as we tried to figure out how to, how to make this, is it a book, is it a movie, is it a series, we researched it as we did our other projects. We kept going back to this and kept researching, and we visited museums. We looked at every possible interview, uh, read every article. 
that's ever been written about it. Um, we've studied the films of uh, Leni Riefenstahl, the great German filmmaker, who documented the games and made her groundbreaking film, Olympia. Um, she's one of our characters who falls in love with a Colorado farm boy uh, named Glenn Morris, who was a decathlete, the most unlikely romance you can imagine, but it's true. Um, so we just kept finding these little details and these anecdotes. And then um, when we thought it was the right time, you know, streaming exploded, and we kept seeing these limited series, you know, 10-episode single-season series. We said, ah, this is perfect. This idea came to you in the 90s. Were you able to contact any survivors uh, who participated in the 1936 Olympics for contributions to this story? No, we were not able to. They had, they had, all, they had all passed on. Matt, did you have a second question? I, I was going to ask, so just hearing you talk about um, the, how the Olympics, like if they would boycott it, it could have had some sort of influence on the on the um on the holocaust and i was thinking about like today we have live golf that mm -hmm. was controversial if you see any parallels with that and your opinion on that sir yeah it's interesting you know some of the people who worked i'll bring up lenny Riefenstahl for example she battles with with this inner turmoil that is she a, a nazi because she's employed by the Nazis. Um, it's a great question, and it's a difficult question. You know, her response is, well, I, this is my job. I'm, this is what I do. I'm getting paid to do this. I should do it as best I can. But she never shed her associations with that. And I think these live golfers, I don't think they're ever going to shed that association with some of the things that, you know, the Saudi government is, is, has been accused of. It's, go ahead, John. In that in that case, the with uh, the, the filmmaker, the, I can't pronounce that name. Um, isn't that a distinction without a difference? To work that closely with the Nazi Party and to produce their uh, their propaganda and to say, "Well, I wasn't a Nazi." It is, but you know, you, people ask, "Well, how could the Holocaust have happened?" Like, what what about the conscience of the, all these people? Like, it couldn't have happened if. It was obviously wrong what they did. How did it happen? So, you know, if you look at it in context, if you're a German citizen, here comes the savior. Um, you just, and if that's your occupation, well, you know, I, I don't think anyone, well, I, I could be wrong, but I think most people in her situation probably would have done the same thing. You, you go along to get along, right? And that, Sadly, yeah, and in that case, also look back, yeah. assure your own survival. Hey, Glenn, we're just about out of time. How can people find your book, Played? Okay, it's on Amazon.com. The book is called Played: The Games of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, and you can also go to www.greenbandana.org. Will we likely see this as a uh, mini series on TV at some point in the future, or a movie? Well, we're, we're hoping it's it, it's in the right hands in, in Hollywood. So, uh, fingers crossed. Right, very good. Thank you so much, Glenn. We appreciate your time and especially your extended time this morning. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.